and we're very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Richard Knox Robinson. Richard Knox Robinson is a photographer and filmmaker. He directed his first short film, The Beekeepers, in 2009, which was selected at the Sundance Film Festival. And he is here to talk about his new documentary film, Rothstein's First Assignment, a story about documentary truth that is up for the for a SIF Jury Award and showing later today at the Harvard Exit at uh, 3.30. So start out, tell us, what was your motivation in uh, producing this film, Rothstein's First Assignment? It, it actually was a, a project that had been on the back burner for a, a long time. I live close to Shenandoah National Park, and I had known that uh, Rothstein had done his first assignment in there before they created the park. And so I had, it sort of long had it in the back of my head to do it. And, um, and I finally came up with the reasons to do it is, um, is the anniversary of the park was coming up. And, um, and when I realized that it was his first assignment, I, I thought this is historically important. I need to sort of check it out and, and see what's going on. And, uh, and so that's what started it really. All right. So can you tell us uh, a bit more about Rothstein himself? What uh, type of photos does he take? Well, he he was one of the um, of the FSA members with Dorothy Lang and Walker Evans. Um, after he got out of college at Columbia, his um, professor Roy Stryker um, started up the the photography section at the Resettlement Administration, which became the FSA. And he brought um, Arthur Rustin down to uh, help him out. And Rustin started by setting up the darkroom, and then. He went out on this first assignment up into the park, and that's sort of how he got going on this. He originally was planning to uh, go to med school, but he never made it. He ended up having probably one of the the best careers of any photographer that's around. You know, he just really had a fabulous career after this assignment. So, talk about the creation of Shenandoah National Park and uh, what you discovered as you started to work on this project. Yeah, it was it's troubling. Um, Living near the park, I had heard quite a few of the stories. There's um, the locals are are still upset about being displaced from their land. They're um, when they created the park, they had to displace um, upwards of 500 families, and they uh, they created a a, bl- a blanket uh, condemnation act uh, where they condemned the land, and they were able to kick everybody out. But it took a long time to put this together, and they. Um, and they did pay some people for their land, not everyone, but a lot of people did get paid something. But the, um, I think it started with Coolidge, and, uh, and then Hoover had it, and then it kind of was completed when, um, when uh, um, Roosevelt came into office. And, um, and that's sort of the basic, simple background to it. But it was a long process. And it was part of a, the National Park Program that uh, they just decided that we need some national parks and... Yeah, they were concerned, you know, most of the parks at that point were, were out west, and most of the people paying for the parks were on the east coast, and they, um, that was sort of a political problem for them, because nobody was actually seeing what they were paying for, and they wanted to have a park that was within a day's drive of the east coast, so people could sort of see what this park project was all about. And so how did they select this specific area? I mean, as you just pointed out, there was 500 families living there. Well, it's... it's it, it's a curious story and a long story. Um, basically, the government put out sort of notice that they were looking for a location for the park. And um, and George Pollock um, owned a resort um, where the park is now called Skyland. And he was very quick to promote his uh, resort to be at the center of the park. And so he put together a group of people, um, Virginians mostly, Senator Byrd and, and a number of other local Virginia businessmen, and they uh, worked for a long time to promote Skyland, his resort, to be at the center of the park. Talk a little bit uh, more about George Pollock. uh, He's a very colorful character that features prominently in your film. Yeah, he, and he's very funny because, you know, the park has a little bit of a mythology around him. He's, they call him often the uh, father of the park, and he's sort of been their central character for how the park got formed, but they don't tell you a lot of the things about his background. His resort was an interesting resort. It had a lot of politicians um, from D.C. would go there out in the summer, and writers and and a number of um, other people. And he, but it's interesting how he got the property was his parents 
um, owned the property as a business interest. It originally was a a mining interest. Uh, it had copper mines on the property, and they didn't really find much copper. And so Pollock convinced his father to allow him to uh, try to turn it into a resort. And um, and so he did that for a while. And um, and then when this park project came up, he he was sort of he was not doing well financially. He was. Um, he had always been sort of on the edge of the bankruptcy, and this is during the Depression, and he kind of, um, I think he saw this as a way to solve his, his, his problems, financial problems, you know, to have a national park, right? You know, to be in a national park, I think he thought he would make a lot of money off of it. His resort, you, you came across a film that features um, Skyland, his resort, prominently in it. The- seems more like a theme park or something, because, I mean, he was sort of a showman. He was famous for his snake dance. He, um, he, um, they even if you go up to the park, they still kind of mention it, his famous snake dance, but they don't really go into it. But he would give on these performances. One, the one I think he was most famous for, he would take rattlesnakes and, and copperheads and dress up as an Arab and blackface and, and dance with these snakes. And uh, the footage I found of that was pretty stunning. I mean, I kind of... Um, I had heard stories about these parties. He also had other parties, like he had an Indian powwow and uh, Indian marriage, where people would dress up as Native Americans and and get married. And, um, and he just had, you know, the locals called it dress up parties, where he would dress up in all these um, sort of ethnic ethnic um, identities. He would, and he would even hire mountain people to dress up as hillbillies. It, it's very. It was very curious to me, just all the stories I heard coming out. And the way the locals perceived him, they kind of thought he was a bad influence. And they, they didn't really want to be around him too much. They kind of, you know, this thought what they were doing up there was crazy. But, uh, yeah, his snake dance, um, I think it's the most incredible thing. And the footage I found of that, it's just, it just floored me when I found it. So get back to, to Rothstein and um, talk about what was his assignment? What was he supposed to do? Officially, I mean, th- that's the big question, I think, of the film, is, is officially um, his assignment was to photograph mountain residents before they were moved out um, to make way for the park. And the official thing that was set up, he, at that point, it was called the Resettlement Administration. And the idea was that they were going to move them into new homes that the government was supplying. And um, there's actually an article in the Washington Post that says government <coughs> moves mountain residents from 19th to 20th century. And so the, um, there was this big fanfare, and he even put captions, his photographs, you know, one of them says Fennel Corbin, who's being moved to a new home, you know, and, and whatnot. And that was the official, the official narrative, at least when I came to it. You know, that's um, what was passed down. And, and that's kind of really what I expected to find. And, um, and actually, when I started doing my research, I, there's, a, there's a street in Madison County that's called Resediment Road, and uh, and that's where I started, you know, looking for families. And there are there are people that were resettled. Um, it's not that they weren't there, but I was surprised to find that the family at the center of this project, that Rothstein's project, really didn't benefit from that at all. Well, expand on that some more. Why why didn't they benefit? They didn't. They weren't sent into new homes. A number of them, and this is sort of the central part of the film, is that. Um, as I started tracking it down, and I started realizing there was um, a certain hollow in in the park, in Corbin Hollow, that was sort of the difficult hollow, and it was where Rothstein spent a lot of his time photographing. And when I started sort of, you know, going person by person and tracking it down, I realized I, I think I don't think anyone from Corbin Hollow got a resettlement home, and a number of the individuals from Corbin Hollow um, were institutionalized when they moved them out of the park, or, or soon thereafter. And generally, they were kind of left to fend for themselves. Uh, Corbin Hollow also had a lot of title disputes, and so they weren't paid anything for their land. They just were basically thrown out. So uh, a hollow would be the equivalent of like a village, or would that be fair? In a sense, a hollow is, is usually just sort of, um, you know, in between two mountains, you know, there's a little hollow. And that's, um, and Corbin Hollow... Um, yeah, it was it was a relatively small hollow, but there's hollows, you know, there's Nicholson Hollow, Corbin Hollow, Dark Hollow, and those are the three, those three are lined up right together, yeah. 
Okay. So, and Corbin Hollow was the nearest hollow to Skyland, is that right? It was. And that was one of the really curious things about it was that um, a lot of these people um, worked for um, Pollock. There was a woman at the head of Corbin Hollow, um, though she's not officially in Corbin Hollow, she was right at the top of it. Her mother had worked for Pollock for 70 years, and there was people in the hollow that had worked for him. And a lot of people... And they would supply him with firewood. They even sold him the snakes for the rattlesnake dances. And then there was also a few Corbin Hollow residents that begged up at the resort. They, um, the stories I was told is they, they had what they called these begging boards, and they would go up to the resort and beg for money. And and there was also um, one, uh, one family that sold flowers. They would pick flowers and sell them to the guests. And there's a lot of curious. A lot of financial arrangements, but they, the interesting thing about Corbin Hollow was, um, from what I can gather, is a lot of Corbin Hollow residents had, had intentionally moved closer to the resort because of the financial arrangements, and they had stopped being farmers, and so they really were quite dependent on the park at that point, you know, when Rossini went up there. And um, I think they were perceived as a problem. And, and Pollock seems to have... Um, used that problem to sort of, to his advantage, to get the park to be centered around his resort. He, because um, in the beginning when he, when he's promoting Skyland to be the center of this new national park, he originally tried to convince everybody that no one lived up there. And, and then he, they found out that that wasn't true. And he said, well, they need to be moved out for their own good. And so, and he used Corbin Hollow as sort of his poster child for justifying moving everybody out of the parks or out of the mountains to make way for the park. So, and these are people that he had hired, a, a lot of them he had hired and yeah. worked with over the years, but he then like turned on them when it became apparent that he could make some money from this sale? It seems to, it seems to be that because, the, you know, I looked at Pollock's um, brochures for his resort, his early brochures, and one thing that was really interesting, God, this is in, in the teens, I think, the early 20th century. He's pretty quick to be using photo photography in his brochures, and he actually photographs Corbin Hollow residents, but he's using them to promote this idea of an authentic mountain culture. And he's sort of selling Skyland as being next to this authentic mountain culture. And he has two Corbin Hollow women, um, and then he has a, a Corbin Hollow man making a basket, which is kind of the stereotype of the region that they made baskets, and they did make baskets, and they still do. Some of them still do today. But, um, but that was before the advent of the idea of the park. And then um, the Depression comes, Pollock stops hiring a lot of people in the area, and, and there's, there's some, uh, they go into poverty. And there's actually a, a Farrow report written about this where they, um, they, they do connect, at least partially, the fact that he, you know, his reduction and employing uh, residents in the area was part of their reason for their poverty. But nonetheless, he starts promoting their poverty. And he starts, he, he literally will take politicians and, and, uh, and newspaper men through Corbin Hollow to sort of to show, show them how poor they are. So talk about Rothstein's project from the standpoint of documentary truth. Was he there to... Uh, from what you've gathered now, do you believe he was there to actually document what was happening, or was he there more as a PR person for this uh, National Parks project? Well, I think I, I think he was, um, you know, the institutionalization led to the sterilization of a lot of the members of Corbin Hollow. And, um, and I realized when I was doing my research, there was a book um, called Hollow Folk that was considered to be an important scientific study when it was done that was about mostly about these hollows in which they list Corbin Hollow as sort of the worst hollow. And one of the things that's actually really ironic about it is they they say Corbin Hollow is the worst hollow because it's the furthest away from civilization, even though it's the closest to the resort. They kind of ignore their own influence on Corbin Hollow. And the thing that I realized when I was doing my research that Rossine had basically photographed the same people that are in this book. And, um, and I started to question, um, you know, what he was doing. Because a, another thing that happened that was sort of curious, because Rossing doesn't leave notes on this assignment. He, he did later, when he did the dust storm photograph and, and later photographs, about six months later, he starts 
keeping typewritten notes on all of his assignments, but this, there's no, no notes in any of the archives that I searched. And so he, um, so I started looking at the historical record, and I found there was a really well-publicized um, eviction, the Kleiser eviction, that happened the same month that Rothstein was up there. Um, happened, he went up there in October of 1935, and October 3rd of 1935, Melanchthon Kleiser was evicted from his home, and he owned a gas station and a nice house, and by some accounts a restaurant, right at the entrance of where the park is now. And Rossney didn't photograph that at all. He didn't photograph where the house had been or anything, but he photographed an apple vendor that was on the same road nearby. And I was really curious about that. It seemed sort of not to be the narrative that I thought he was documenting. I was sort of, you know, he's, he's working for the Resettlement Administration. I figure he's going to photograph people that are being moved out of their homes. And he doesn't... And, and, and Kleiser's eviction is in all the local papers. And he's actually getting... A lot of support from the locals because a lot of people are resisting the creation of the park, you know, because they don't want to move from their land. And and Rossing doesn't even take one frame of it, you know. And he but he photographs the apple vendor on the same road, probably within a mile. So he definitely goes by it, you know. And the park photographed it, so it, it's known. I mean, it's 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 not like it's not known. And and that sort of got the ball rolling for me. And then. You know, I just slowly sort of picked through it and started to put together that there was another narrative. You know, another narrative I'd never heard about that the book Hollow Folk is kind of the center of. Hollow Folk, um, it, it's funny, I had to do a lot of research in eugenics to understand this, but Hollow Folk, in, in Virginia, um, I guess it was, Hollow Folk came out in 1933. In 1927, there was a famous eugenic book also done in Virginia, uh, called the Wind Tribe, and which actually stands for White Indian and Negro, um, and the uh, that was done down in Amherst County, and supposedly Hollow Folk was making a stance that it, it wasn't focused on eugenics; it was focused on environmental factors as the cause of of people's poverty, and. Um, but I found a scholar that had looked at it, and he found that the, basically these same arguments were there that were for the eugenics books that came before Hollow Folk. And that kind of, you know, I started to get really curious, you know. And then one scholar told me about one child being sterilized. And um, I started realizing that the, the narrative in Hollow Folk was the narrative that Rothstein was documenting. I mean, his photographs so closely follow it. And there's even one photograph that he does that is almost identical to a photograph in the book. And, you know, the woman, there's one woman who has four illegitimate children, and, and he focuses on her tremendously, and she's at the center of the book. You know, and just the more you go through it, the more you put it together, that's what he's illustrating, that's his narrative, you know, and it, it became quite clear. And then I just, you know, and then I started going to the court records, and, and things really started becoming clear. So you believe he, and he had full knowledge of what he was photographing what the real project was or I don't know I mean that's the big question the um, and that's what kind of led me through the whole film you know it was I went through this process where you know it resembles eugenics it I think it's eugenics and then eventually it became eugenics and then the next thing was you know does Rothstein know does he know what he's doing and the one um, there's a couple things that are incriminating you know and I can't you know I can't read his mind his interview with Richard Dowd that I use in the film he doesn't, you know, he doesn't mention it. But there, um, there are a couple of incriminating things. One, if you look at his archive, and it's all online now, so anyone can look at it. And if you, if you just make an educated guess about the children that he spends the most time photographing, I found that pretty much most of those children, um, and possibly all of them, it's hard to track them all down, um, were institutionalized, sent to the colony, which is which was known for sterilizations and. Um, and that's one thing, and that and that actually helped me figure it out because once I sort of made that guess, um, I, I could figure a lot of things out. There's um, there's another thing when you uh, Nicole Raffner wrote a really good book about um, what's called white trash studies about eugenic studies of poor uh, poor white families, and she describes this pattern of focusing on one problem family and and how the eugenicists would do that and. Um, and then they, and then everybody in that family would be considered for sterilization. And and so I sort of went, okay, who is that family? 
in this project, and I did find a family at the center of Rothstein's project. I don't really want to... I'm trying not to give names as much as possible for privacy reasons, but that family is at the center of Hollow Folk. It's at the center of Rothstein's project, and throughout that family, children are sterilized all the way down. And I actually found one woman from that family that was sterilized that went on the record for me that kind of, you know, brought it all together. So, so you have that, and then the last... I guess incriminating thing, I think that that really makes me question if he knew is that um, when I went to the court records to um, to start looking at you know who you know to see if I could find the commitment papers you know because when you know luckily in this country when you commit someone you still have to document it and uh, it's hard to get to those records but sometimes you can and um, I found that two children were committed. Um, on November 3rd, 1935. Um, and Rothstein, I found actually, his first date, I think, in the mountains was October 17th, and he says he was up there for a couple weeks. Um, so he's probably there. And these two children, their address that they have listed as their home is Pollux Resort Skyland, which was really curious to me. Um, but the, the kind of clincher was two days before, uh, excuse me, they're committed on November 1st, um, 1935. On November 3rd, 1935, an article comes out in the Washington Post, this article that I mentioned before about, um, you know, government is giving, the, it's moving mountain residents from the 19th to 20th century. Well, the photograph of the mountain woman in that article, she's the mother of these two children. And actually, one of the children, I believe, is in one of the photographs is in the paper. And, and I just, for me, that was stunning. And I, you know, as a photographer myself, I know um, editors always call, call you at the last minute. They say, you know, this guy's going to be gone tomorrow. You've got to photograph him today. And, and it just seems to me that's the perfect rationale for why he was there when he was there. Because he got there right before the first wave of kids were sent down. The first two kids were sent down. And, and the other thing that happens is two years later... Um, and another FSA photographer, John Vachon, um, goes up and takes um, two photographs of Corbin Hollow, the Corbin Hollow ruins, at the same time that this sort of next wave of kids are sent out. And I, I just can't understand why they would send him up to take two photographs. I mean, it's a bit of a trip to take two photographs. And, um, and it's just, and I, and the records are that a number of other children were sent down right about that same time. That's right about when they really started kicking people out of the park. And, um, and at that same time, there's audio recordings made of the families because they, they had a unique Old English accent that um, a lot of the scholars were very interested in. And the, the subjects of the two photos that the last, that last yeah. photographer you mentioned, who were they again? The same children? No, he doesn't photograph any people. He just has what's called a Corbin Hollow ruin. It's just a, a fireplace um, without a house attached to it. And it's, it's not really explained. There's a couple other photographs that might be from Corbin Hollow, but it just have buildings. And it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to me. It's kind of a, it's a real curious um, photograph. And um, but the timing of it, it's in 1937. It's two years later. And um, that's about the time I found some audio recordings made in November of 1937. There was two UVA professors that went up actually with the social worker. Oh, behind, I have to mention that part too. But um, that um, made 12 audio recordings of this family too um, in 1937. I found two of them. I don't know where the other 10 are. But the other thing that incriminates Rossi, and I forgot about this, it's very complicated, but um, the social worker that did most of the studies, Miriam Sizer, and she had lived in the mountains for years with, with these families um, and had provided most of the research for the book Hollow Folk. Um, Rothstein photographed her. I found two images of her in his archive, which, you know, you know, the other thing I know as a photographer was when you're photographing in a neighborhood you don't know, it's not unusual to have someone leading you through, particularly a social worker. I mean, that's ideal. You know, you're going to have someone that's working with these people for years. They give you easy access. They can do all the introductions. And, uh, and he has two untitled outtakes of Miriam Sizer. She's in front of uh, Corbin Hollow School. And uh, so she was there 
when he was there and likely led him. And also, I, a scholar had talked to me, um, someone off the record, but he said that um, the, the official authors of Hollow Folk um, had actually briefed Rothstein before he did his assignment. So it makes sense that he, you know, he, he talked to them and then he met up with Miriam Sizer when he gets to the mountains. And, and so she led him, I believe, to photograph these children that he photographed. You mentioned the colony. Can you expand on that? What is that? Yeah, the colony was the, uh, the premier uh, institution for the sterilization of children in Virginia, in Lynchburg, Virginia. And um, they, they, did, they sterilized at a lot of institutions, but the colony was particularly um, big on it. And that's where most of the children from Corbin Hollow and the records that I found were sent to. And, and that's generally what they did at the colony. And there's... Um, Mary Bishop actually helped me a lot. She was a reporter from Roanoke that has done a lot of reporting on the colony. And she actually led me to the woman uh, from Corbin Hollow that she had interviewed before. Um, she allowed me to, she led me to her so that I could interview her as well. And I found out that she was, you know, the granddaughter of the head of this family. So it sounds like in addition to the injustice of just moving these people out of their homes that they've lived there for generations that while they're presenting this to the public that they're resettling these people it right. sounds like a significant portion of them were in fact s sterilized and put into institutions well and that's a big theme you know the propaganda behind this is, is really kind of incredible i mean it, it's um i didn't want to say that for a long time but it just the misleading information, there's kind of like these canards that are thrown in your way all the time. And, um, yeah, the, the, um, it's, it's surprising. I, I'm not sure why they did it. You know, why didn't they give them all new homes? I, I think maybe because they thought it was too expensive. I know the state politician at that point was complaining that it was too expensive. Um, but the, um, it's hard to know. That's another story, really, to figure out why, how extensive it was, and... Um, you know, how far down the mountains does it go? Because after, you know, after the park, there's the Blue Ridge Parkway as well, where they kicked out a lot of people to make the Blue Ridge Parkway. It goes almost all the way down to Tennessee. I mean, there's, I've heard some pretty disturbing stories that it, must, it might go much further than what I've uncovered. I just have one family. But there's, um, there's many stories of sterilizations all the way down. And as you also pointed out in the film, sterilization wasn't exactly uh, a guaranteed to be a safe science uh, in addition to just sterilizing someone people could die from it right and mary and mary francis who's in the film almost did when she was sterilized she, she was sterilized very young and and the doctors um sort of said it's up to god if she survives and she did survive luckily but um yeah it was kind of you know if someone pointed out to me i don't think penicillin maybe had just been invented at that point there wasn't you know they doing a surgery like that was pretty, a lot more risky than it would be today so with that, we're uh, out of time. I want to thank you for coming and spending time with us this morning. Great. Thank you.